All right. Wow. Yeah, we could have fit into BYU Bookstore, right? <laughs> uh, we're going to need a bigger ballroom. Um, awesome. So, um, is there still music playing? Yeah. Can, how, who can kill the music? Is this? What's that? <laughs> Carrie, you want me to sing along? No. Uh, so what we're going to do tonight um, is what I generally do at my signings. Um, we'll start with me speaking at you for a while. I have a little thing. You can ignore it. It's Professor Sanderson being me. Uh, I like to talk. It happens. Um, after that, we will do a Q&A. Um, and so just to let you know, please make sure your questions are not spoilery, okay? Um, <laughs> this is, uh, even if you think that, you know, it's, it's not that, just try to talk around it, or if, you, if it's a spoilerific question, just wait till you come through the line to ask me. Um, so, yeah, you would, you would think that everyone here has read the books, but not necessarily. Uh, there are lots of people who get dragged here by significant others. Uh, <laughs> who are like, really? This is what we're doing? <laughs> it's 10 o'clock. Um, so then after the Q&A, I will go through a few little announcements. And then after that, I will do a reading for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the reading is from The Secret Project on my website. So, yeah. It's something new, so it's not a sequel to something. I know some of you will be sad about that, but, uh, but it, is, uh, it is new and fun and exciting. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, so what am I going to talk to you about? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a story. Um, and you're going to have to indulge me because this is about one of my children. And as a proud father, I like, uh, I like seeing the things my children do. And one day, I came into the room into the kitchen, and one of my children was sitting there playing, and he didn't see me. And he didn't know I was there. He was just playing by himself. What he had is he had some of this kinetic sand. You know, it's like sand that sticks together, whatever. And he had his little trucks, and he was driving them in them. Um, this, is, this is Oliver, who uh, was three years old at the time. So he's really little and really cute. This is the problem. They get older, and then they're not cute anymore. But, <laughs> uh, but... You know, he, he, was, he was little, he could, you know, barely talk, and he's playing with his trucks, and he, he's doing the thing where they're talking to each other, and you're like, oh, and he's like, you know, let's go get some ice cream, and then he drives to get some ice cream, and he, he's having him do all these little things, and he lines them all up in a row afterward, and I just think, oh, he's so cute, he's so precious, and then he says, if you liked this video, please hit subscribe. <laughs> Please like me on Facebook and leave a comment in the comment section. He literally said this to an empty room, right? Um, it was the, I wish I'd been videoing it. It was hilarious. Um, and it kind of um, struck me at how different his life is than, than mine was when I was growing up. Um, you know, he, he, he has seen people model play on YouTube, which is, he just figures that's how you finish playing, is you say, please like me on Facebook, right? <laughs> uh, please subscribe. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it, had, it sent, me, sent, sent me into this kind of spiral of thinking, of being nostalgic, right? Um, Oliver, who's named after James Oliver Rigney, uh, Robert Jordan, um, was born... Um, what was it, nine days after A Memory of Light came out? Um, in fact, I went on tour for that shortly after he was born. So if you see my wife tonight, she's a saint. <laughs> um, sending your husband on book tour right after you had a baby. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting to think about um, how his life is growing up so differently uh, from mine. Like I said, it made me, it made me kind of nostalgic. Um, and nostalgia is kind of a big thing right now. I don't know if you guys have noticed. Um, and so, of course, being me, I started thinking about the nature of nostalgia, right? Like, why, why am I nostalgic? I think of, like, for instance, um, I started writing uh, books like 20 years ago, right? And during some of those early days trying to break in, 
my life was miserable <laughs> um, in some ways, right? You don't know, I didn't know if I was going to get published. I didn't know if I was going to sell a book. Um, what, what we would do is I would go to conventions with my friends, um, Dan Wells and Peter Alstrom. Um, and we spent many years going to these conventions trying to break in and we would look for editors who were at the science fiction conventions who were there um, and we would try to pitch books to them. And they, um, they would get this look in their eyes, right? Like the, the deer in the headlights when they saw aspiring authors coming up to them and they would like look to hide behind the planters. Um, I mean, they're there on one hand to be science fiction editors, on the other hand, they get a little tired of people uh, pitching books at them. And so what we actually learned to do, uh, we, we called it petering people. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Peter is my, my editorial uh, assistant now, and he's worked with me for many years. He wanted to be an editor. And what we would do is, Dan and I wanted to be writers, and so we learned that if you found an editor and you said to them, hey, our friend wants to be an editor, instead of running and hiding, they would immediately go, oh, you poor, poor boy. Uh, <laughs> they would put their arm around him and be like, oh, it's so miserable. Let's talk about having to live in New York and all these authors who will ignore all the great advice you give them. And all they just go, they would just open up and they would talk to Peter and they would be like, oh, you should do this and this. And they'd look at us and they'd be like, oh, and you guys want to be editors too? And we're like, no, we're writers. And hold up our manuscripts. Um, <laughs> right? But then they're trapped in a conversation with us already. It worked so well. Um, we would... We, <laughs> we, we would go to these conventions and we would, uh, we'd all have to share a room. So like we're, we're either sleeping on the floor, or there's like six of us in a bed or whatever. Um, Ethan Scarsdett went to some of those with me. He's here tonight. I, I don't know where he is, but he's Scar from Bridge Four. Oh, he's right over there. There's Scar. Say hi to Scar. If you want to know what Scar looks like, uh, that's Scar except Alephi. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, he, he took me to my, he went on the very first one with me uh, to New York, where I'll, I'll say they were really accommodating on Manhattan. They stole our umbrellas. Really made us feel like we, we got the true Manhattan experience, right, Scar? <laughs> um, we would go to these things and we'd like cram into these little rooms um, and we'd watch terrible movies all night. Um, afterward, and it, it's, it's weird. I look back at those days, and I'm nostalgic for them. Why do I miss those days, right? Why, like, I, I, I'm going to tell you guys, I would much rather come and have 3,000 people in a room, 3,000 people, um, waiting to see me than to be wondering if I'm ever going to sell a book um, and if I'm going to have to keep working a graveyard shift at a hotel for the rest of my life to support this writing addiction of mine. Um, but... It, it, ooh. <laughs> so why am I nostalgic, right? Like why, I, but I think on one hand, it's just kind of human nature. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, one of my, my favorite philosophers, this will tie in, I promise, um, you know, kind of, the way I tie things in, um, is Heraclitus, right? The, the, the philosopher said everything flows. Um, he said, uh, you may know the philosophy better is uh, you can never step in the same river twice. That wasn't Pocahontas, that was Heraclitus. <laughs> well, it was Pocahontas too, but um, this idea that everything has to change um, and everything must change um, is, is kind of like a theme in our lives. It's how things work. In fact, um, this is part of why looking at things changing in my life that uh, when I started the Stormlight Ar Archive, I built the very first magic system for it, which was soul casting. Uh, it was called soul forging back then, by the way. And then I read a really great book series where people were forging souls. It was uh, the Robin Hobb books. I'm like, forging's been used too much. Um, but it was the first magic system I built for this series because the theme of the series was going to be transformation. Um, it was people changing from one thing into another. And 
the idea of kind of a classical alchemical, you can change one element into another using the magic was really interesting to me. I've talked about before, I love that era, um, which by the way, the, that era in science, which, that, that era in time which we often refer to as the Renaissance, when alchemy got big, was also like the biggest nostalgic trip that's ever happened in the history, in history, right? Um, they were nostalgic for, for Greek philosophers, which obviously I am too, because I just quoted one. Um, but this idea, alchemy being this big thing during the Renaissance where they're like, we think that if we just apply science to everything that people have been superstitious about in the past, we can make it work. And spoiler, they couldn't, but the fact that they tried has always been really, really, really interesting to me. Um, and so, so you guys get the trial run on the speech. By the time I get through my 20th time on this, I won't need this, but you know, you guys get to be the guinea pigs. Um, oh yeah, you like that. You guys would clap for anything. You're awesome. <laughs> We're just wasting time till I can give you your books at 10 o'clock, but we won't say that, yeah. <laughs> By the way, ni nice that we got to move to 10 o'clock, right? It's, it's, we figure it's midnight in New York, so it's, that counts as a midnight release, right? We'll, we'll just cheat a little bit, and then my children can come um, and, and bother people. <laughs> um, so, Soul casting, this idea of transformation, the way I started the Stormlight Archive, the very first things that I wrote down specifically for the book um, were these ideas that I was going to come up with 10 elements that were not your classical Greek elements, and I was going to build um, a magic system. Basically, originally, one of the ideas was for all the, the Knights Radiant to each be able to soul cast uh, one element into something. Um, I moved away from that through revisions and things like that, but that was the original concept. So that, that thing that's in the front of the first book, the double eye of the Almighty, the little map thing, it's the first thing I came up with. I did it myself. Uh, poor Isaac, uh, he eventually had to try and interpret this and make it look good. Um, but I, I, did it, I did it in MS Paint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did it in MS Paint um, with the whole concept of transformation as a theme. Uh, now, I've said before that Dalinar is actually the oldest piece of the Stormlight Archive. He started in the Dragonsteel uh, books, and he, I pulled him out when I started bil building um, Stormlight. But the first original thing for the series I wrote down was this idea of soul casting, this idea of transformation, um, and the idea that, you know, things change. Everything changes. You can't step in the same river twice. That, that philosophy was because the river is always changing. Water is always wearing away those banks. The, that river won't be there the next minute. It will be a different river that happens to be in the same place. Um, and while I was working on this book, actually, um, I was drawing that out. I went to a World Fantasy Convention in Montreal, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and we had gotten really good at petering people. Uh, but <laughs> We were really good at it, and we had also gotten really good at stalking editors. <laughs> like, we would go to people we know. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. Some mood lighting. Um, <laughs> we would go to people we knew who would say, okay, okay, who are the new editors who are hungry for new authors, who haven't bought uh, a lot of books yet, but, but are, are looking to buy books? And they'd say, oh, you should go find this person. And at this convention, someone said, oh, you should go find Moshe Fader. This was 2001, wasn't it, Peter? Or maybe 2000? 2001. 2001. Um, so we, um, it's 2001, and we heard this name, Moshe. Moshe Fader. You need to find Moshe Fader. And I got to tell you, Dan Wells is really, really good at stalking people. <laughs> In fact, when he eventually started writing books about serial killers, we're all like, uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, um, and we spent this whole convention looking for this guy, Moshe Fader, and eventually um, we found him at a, at, at, at a, at a party. Was it, was it you who found him, Peter? Or was it, it was Dan. It was Dan, yeah, I mean, the stalker. Um, I didn't say that, no, sponge that from the record. Um, the very nice man who would never stalk anyone um, found 
Moshe, he came, Dan came and got me. I remember that party. He's like, I found him and grabbed me. And we went over and we chatted with Moshe for like an hour and a half, which mostly because Moshe likes to talk was us nodding <laughs> and him telling us about stuff. Um, and this is the guy who eventually bought um, a launchers from me and I am not a serial killer from Dan. Um, and so <laughs> it really worked out um, finding Moshe. It, it was a really fun experience. Like I said, I'm nostalgic for these days, as terrible as they were. Um, after we talked to Moshe, it was like 1 a.m. And we are just hyped because we'd spent this whole convention hunting for this guy. Um, and we decided that we would go celebrate by getting food. But it was 1 a.m. So we just kind of went to walk down the street, uh, down from the hotel. I think we'd gone this place once before. We found it open. It was an Italian place. Um, there was nobody else in there. There was nobody else ever in there. Um, in fact, there was just a, a guy who always like, spent the whole time we were there on the phone in the back kind of yelling in Italian. Um, so we don't know what was up there. We won't make any judgment calls. Um, but uh, we went there, and the bookie was there, and he... Uh, I didn't say that either. Um, <laughs> uh, we, got, we got our food. We were ordering, but Peter had trouble ordering. Peter was not in the mood for, for Italian food. Um, he, didn't, he didn't want, and we, he was delaying. He's like, oh, I don't know. And the guy, he walks up. He's like, what do you want? I can make you whatever you want. And Peter's like, I want Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said, done. I'll, I'll make you a, some Chinese spaghetti. Um, and he ran in the back. He took it, Peter's menu. He didn't let him say a thing, or some Italian, yeah, some Chinese spaghetti. He just ran in the back. And he came out a little while later with spaghetti that had been stir fried <laughs> with, uh, with some Chinese sauce. It was good, right, Peter? It was den, den yeah, it was denjang sauce, wasn't it? We decided, uh, a Korean sauce. So it was really Korean spaghetti. But we will forgive him. And he made this thing, this Chinese spaghetti. Um, and we, ever since then, we've talked about this idea of Chinese spaghetti that was made for Peter. And this does relate, by the way. <laughs> does relate. Does relate. Uh, this is the sort of stuff that's going through my head before a book comes out. What am I thinking about? I'm thinking about Chinese spaghetti and how it relates to Heraclitus is what I'm thinking about. <laughs> um, because my, my actual famous, most favorite quote from Heraclitus, and I'm going to read it to you because I, I get it wrong all the time, um, is, all things come into being, uh, I guess I'm not going to read it. All things come into being through the conflict of opposites. That's a really interesting thought. I've always loved that. Everything exists because uh, opposites are in conflict with one another. Um, and this is kind of a writing principle um, because um, I feel like lots of great books, what they do is they mash up this idea of something brand new and something familiar. All books are like a, a mashup of your, your influences versus uh, reacting toward them and reacting against them at the same time. Um, there's this weird tension in fiction. It's like you want to do something new, but you can only use what you've seen before. And so it's like this constant war between nostalgia and originality that makes fiction happen, at least for me. Um, if you look at the Stormlight books, it's me saying, wow, I love big epic fantasies like uh, The Wheel of Time. Absolutely love them. I want to do something like that. But I don't want to do something like that because that's been done. At the same time, feeling these two emotions together, this war between the past and the future, um, constantly exists inside of me. And that's where the stories come from. Um, that's where Roshar came from. I'm going to do a big epic fantasy, but I want to do a world like has never been in an epic fantasy before. And that's where the storm came from, because this idea of things getting birthed out of conflict is so fascinating to me. Um, every, uh, every major world religion has change as an aspect of it. This idea that what you are now is not what you will eventually be you will become something more, either through kind of Buddhist or Hindu um, beliefs where you're looking inwardly toward, uh, toward perfection or you're looking outwardly in something like a more uh, Judeo-Christian religion uh, for a source of inspiration or a source of change. We believe that change is how we become what we want to be. And in fact, it's, it's a scientific principle as well. 
the, the whole idea is that, um, that change over time is essential to how a species will continue to exist, right? Then those changes aren't always good. That's the th part that we, uh, we, we kind of ignore when we're talking about things like natural selection. Is like some of those are terrible changes. A mutation happens and the whole line dies off. But some of those changes are good and then they stick. Um, so I think it's both kind of a secular and a spiritual idea that without change, we wouldn't be here. And change is the method by which we are going to become better. Um, and if things could never change, then we, it would be terrible. In fact, if you look at the mythos of science fiction and fantasy, a lot of the time, the villain is the person who wants to become immortal and never be forced to change again. This is what Lord Voldemort wanted, right? To never have to change, to always be able to remain the same. This is the whole origin of the vampire mythos, is this idea that there's a dark side to never being forced to change. Um, so what is the point of all of this? Where, where am I going? Well, um, it's this nostalgia idea, which I'm not as down on it. Everyone's like, oh, nostalgia, terrible, terrible, terrible. Why, why is everyone only going to movies about nostalgia? I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not there. I, I think nostalgia is good for us. But I feel like the looking backward, the point is, and if I have a, a, a summation and a theme for this speech, it is that looking backward, the point of it is to see where we are now and to recognize how far we've come. So let's use nostalgia, let's use looking backward as a contrast to looking forward and let that change make us better. And if you like this, please hit subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> like me on Facebook. Uh, go to my Insta face or whatever that is, yeah. <laughs>